Hi, Tom. Thanks for um, joining me again. Um, this is uh, Saturday, September 3rd, 2022. And um, yeah, so just a quick rundown from uh, last time that we spoke. Um, it's been a few months and a lot of stuff has happened in the world, um, politically, economically, uh, spiritually. There's been a lot of uh, strife, obviously. Uh, especially in the U.S., a lot of division. And, um, yeah, just a lot's happened since just a few months ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know um, we were talking before about compliance and um, how those in, in power right now really want um, a lot of people to be uh, under this kind of hypnosis or spell with just obeying everything that um the elite in the government want wants the uh populace to do right and um yeah do you have any thoughts you'd like to share on that right now right now this very day things are happening at a warp speed it's incredible what's going on now one of the biggest signs of change is when top elite officials who have held decades long positions in top seats suddenly start to vacate without reasons for their exit from corporations they've been successful in. And that's exactly what's going on. You have the exit of um, one of the biggest player in Warner Brothers, the lady who has been steering the ship and has a wonderful reputation, although she's not a good person. She's been actually in charge of some of the biggest uh, cover-ups going on, and now she may be moving to Netflix. So she is on the run right now, and that's right after they struck my website. It's now struck with a 404 warning, right after we just had a conference call with a documentary team where we know we've got this, and it'll be the biggest thing ever. This is also following um, a spray by which I want people to be aware of is how they are now operating um, to uh, induce symptoms in the population. What you'll see in your community as a targeted community, you'll see what looks like crop dusting from North by Northwest with Cary Grant on the ground in the cornfield. And that's exactly what it is. I wanna show you right now, um, just something I'm just gonna hold it up. And this is what just happened the other night. And you'll notice I have certain symptoms. Let me see if I can get it to play. Come on, play. Well, there, that's interesting. Hold on. But anyway, so yeah, what they do is they crop dust your area and then suddenly everybody has those flu-like symptoms. It's very, very interesting. And uh, I have it right here. If it play, no sound. Very interesting. All right, well, it's not gonna allow the sound. <laughs> My goodness, this is crazy. Is this video that you recorded yourself? Yeah. What you'll see is, see the play with the chemtrail or the trail? It's not a chemtrail. This is spraying. This is spraying toxins. And what, I'm just holding it up one more time. I have no sound on my phone. My phone's owned by AT&T, which is also Warner Brothers company. There's been debates on this from the inside shills. No, Warner Brothers does own A&T components, AT&T component. And uh, so let me just play this one more time. Come on, go, baby. You're gonna have a lot of interruption on these things. It, they're not gonna let certain things play. Um, if you look very closely, you'll see the cam trail. Or not a cam trail. Yeah, yeah I, I see the trail what, behind the... Right, that's what happens over and over. Now, if you hear the sound, which they're not allowing right now on the phone, I'll have video cut, all kinds of stuff um, from the company owning it. In fact, tech reps have said, you know, we can't even access the problem. And I said, well, since I'm here at AT&T offices, Watch what happens. It'll correct itself in a moment, even though it's been down for hours. And right after I said that, it'll correct itself. And they'll go, oh, what, has, what just happened? I said, this is being controlled. And so let me see if I can get the sound now. Watch this. Listen to the sound. Come on, go. I'm so tired of the games, too. I'll, I will tell you, I am tired of the games. Yeah, this is something that, that happens a lot, too. Wow, that's really a loud aircraft. It is a jet spraying a trail 
to make people sick. Now this happened a year ago and I came down with the uh, COVID symptoms and it was um, considered the uh, worst kind, uh, the Delta kind. And so what's interesting is this just happened now with the Warner Brothers resigning, with our documentary team ready to go, with the website struck, with interviews being hit. And then you have this where that jet is going by and it went over our, our place, over our place, then it went outside, then it did next lane, next lane, next lane, next lane. And now all the people around the area are having the same symptoms, which are upper respiratory, red burning eyes, cramping in the body, sore throat, sour stomach, headaches. It's the thing we've been talking about where it's manufactured and now it's delivered right to your door as if it's Federal Express. So that's what they're doing. And then you see an outbreak in your community. It's getting where they're now using sledgehammer techniques that are just blatant in the public. And while they're resigning from top positions, I mean, this lady was three decades in the, in the making in position, now leaving Warner Brothers, probably for Netflix where the laundering is occurring. So what we're seeing is a complete now leaving the ship, running for cover, they have collapsed. A uh, meeting was being held to have me put away on another, what they call a 302, where they just need a family member to be bought, well, rewarded in my family, and say from a congressman who's also a lifelong FBI operative, Brian Fitzpatrick, that you uh, that the person's calling you all the time and saying they're suicidal and going to kill somebody. Well, that's very convenient. Those are the two parameters. That's exactly what was going on. They were gonna do what's called another intervention to lock away this particular author and rip away from his son. So do you it, have it, any, it, um like any information on brian fitzpatrick um, yes. currently like yes. what it, what he's been doing like this year so far he's involved in ukraine again he was the one that set it up in 2014 that article i think i showed you the article where they did a cover article in the local paper philadelphia paper and it showed that he was there with trudeau's representative in ukraine in 2014 to destabilize the government same thing Germany did with Austria in World War II and others. They would subjugate, uh, destroy the people who were actually protecting that government and that didn't agree with their views. That's exactly what it says in the cover article. Where Fitzpatrick's talking about how they didn't move for reforms fast enough. Victor Shokin is the, was the uh, equivalent of the attorney general in Ukraine, uh, our equivalent of our attorney general. So what they did was they ruined his career and then Fitzpatrick goes on and on about it, how they destroy the life of this man. And they even use intellectual property to have to do it, even says. And so they destroy his life, get him out. And incidentally, Trump tried to cover for the man and said he was a good man. Why are you doing this to him? But they destroyed his life and in the biolabs in the same year, advertising for scientists for the biolabs. So really their game is you know, all the cheating moves are out in the spotlight right now, and they can't stop it. So they're striking websites, trying to make people sick, trying to threaten intervention things. The intervention thing failed. And it's interesting, Steve, that as soon as that failed, there went the top person for Warner Brothers vacating her position after a successful stint of three decades of doing the cover-up of all the intellectual property theft. And what's her name again? Her name is Courtney Valentine. And she comes from a very prestigious cabal family that had uh, controls in, in Hollywood. So it's very interesting that they are now collapsing. The same thing happened in our situation before. When we came forward with a planted attorney they had provided that had a suspended license to throw the case and make it look like he lost, has nothing here. They still push that. That's when Joel Silver and Mike Lang vacated. Mike Lang being the uh, president, one of the vice presidents of Disney and became in charge of Film Tracks, the Disney Library. And also you had, he was Harvey Weinstein's boss, Joel Silver, who is the co-owner of the Matrix franchise. All leaving at the same time. So now you're seeing the shakeups that have never been seen before. It was Sophia Stewart that had called me with her team, a handler from Warner Brothers, saying that you have caused this shakeup. It's the biggest shakeup they ever had. Now they're having the second biggest shakeup they've ever had. So when did Joel Silver leave? Um, Joel yeah, left Brothers. in 2012, the same time, within a month of Mike Lang leaving Disney's Miramax Films. Miramax Films was instituted in 1993 to launder uh, co copyrights, launder pieces, 90, 90s pieces that Disney didn't own. So they came up with a strategy on how to acquire these rights. And that strategy boiled down to the death of the authors and then picking the venue of court you want 
and then pushing through that you actually have those rights. Now, there's a very interesting process involved in our situation in our family as the documentary comes forward and we're revealing all of this, all these gold nuggets. And I think people are just going to be, oh my God, here it is. The skin will be off, the curtains be pulled back. It's going to be a pound of flesh. And so what you're going to see is they're, they're never going to recover from this. And so what happens is you have a situation where my brother is owned with Disney contracts, low-level Disney contracts. They don't really respect him. He's a failure. But they gave him little architect projects down at the Sheraton in Disney World. And that way they keep him in tow. He's also under Spielberg's direct control because his top man, Spielberg's top man, Ben Burt, who's in all the credits, uh, his cousin is Diane Groves, married to the brother. Also, you have Warner Brothers' top writers and officials on my brother's side as friends. He's also an active pedophile posting pictures of young girls, preteens on the youth, lead, youth leading trips underwater in their bikinis and through the bushes. So you have a sick man who fits the profile, my brother, who's then supposed to claim my work. That's what they came up with through Mike Lang. And keep in mind, Steve, Mike Lang of Disney is also the one that provided the honeypot wife, Rebecca Northcutt, who is the one that left my son and I on my birthday, July 2nd. We had the emails they tried to strike from our devices. They struck them, but we had an external uh, storage. The emails from Mike Lang, Ziet Zion saying, Becca, move in with me for 60 days on my birthday in Spokane, Washington, in the most historic, expensive property he bought uh, from Southern California up in Spokane, Washington, Playground Hollywood. So he was asked, she was, he's asking her to move in as Mr. Spad, the wife of the author. And I have him on tape for the documentary in a call where he's using effing this and effing that. And uh, right in front of her, after he took her. It is gonna be a blow away, hands down, wipeout. That is why that lady just left Warner Brothers because of the production team meeting we just had where we're not gonna stop. Wow. And that, so like that, that's a lot of um, really sketchy stuff on their end with what they did to you. <laughs> and it, to put it shortly, but um, now how b being, um, a, f a filmmaker myself and a film watcher like I've had to really rethink everything that I've known about current cinema mm -hmm. and people who I've looked up to now right. like I mean I have to really go back and um, do a second third rake through of everybody yeah and um I know I had mentioned uh, before we got on this um, this call today that um, my well my top five films list has changed, and um, prior to uh, being introduced to you and then um, meeting you and talking with you, I had The Matrix as my number one film, mm -hmm. and I had The Truman Show as my number two film, and I had the Dark Knight as the number three film. <laughs> so <laughs> I really couldn't um, look at that anymore and be comfortable with it, knowing everything that's going on behind the scenes regarding those. Because it, to me now, like, espe especially after knowing you and talking with you, like, th those projects are tainted yeah. with uh, deceit involved. And really, it feels like it's all um orchestrated to wind you up and poke poke at you and try to break you down mentally yeah that's exactly it they it's common knowledge throughout the industry that the work was lifted and used in multiple ways that's why that copyright entries that they put in with the title the immortals where the Wachowskis just reversed letters letters and made matrix well the Wachowskis were angry at Warner Brothers and the other film companies because they were given another writer brought in to finish Assassins, their debut project. So what happened was uh, they actually copyrighted these, all these titles under the Immortals, no, no body of work, and the Wachowskis were supposed to pick one of those titles, they didn't. And then they went further to stick in my personal information, as we said, high school, birthday, my dad's name, my name, that cannot be ignored. So what the documentary is going to be doing is allowing people to digest all this as gold nuggets, step by step, and be allowed to believe what the other side is calling overwhelming and con convoluted. Now public people will be allowed to believe the overwhelming evidence where before they would say it's too much. Now they'll be like, no. What's interesting too, Steve, the other side is now saying that I'm the architect. They're, they said they put me in my own film and now they're trying to uh, capsulize me as the architect. Well, that's very interesting. They're in my world and in my world, 
uh, if I'm the architect, I'll be a good one. I won't be a bad one. I'll try to give the power to the people that deserve it. And you mentioned Truman Show, so I did some brushing up on Truman Show. Because yes, you're right, Contact said, watch the Truman Show, Tom, they've written this about you. And when I went to it right away, if you look at the side of the boat, Santa Maria, why is that important? Well, Santa Maria on the Truman Show, Santa Maria is where the wo woman I loved ended up uh, leaving me for Santa Maria. That's where she went with PCPA, Pacific Coast uh, you know, Observatory, or I can't, whatever it's called, PCPA in San Maria. That's where she, that's where the most devastating point in my life. And then if you look further in the graphics in there, you also have Lancaster uh, Square is the main place that he's dealing with. Lancaster is where I went to college. So it's like, yeah, they go this over and over. And then you have, what's interesting too, the wives being provided, that's exactly what they do. For the authors, they figure are their star players on the bench. They feel they own us as assets. The government sees us the societies, the alphabet boys, as assets. So the Pentagon views us as assets and uh, the film industry views us as star players. And they, there is no real separate companies. In the film industry, they're all basically one company, cigars and brandy, and they just trade personnel back and forth. The lady I showed you earlier, she is going, they're saying how she's going to be going to either uh, Netflix or Universal Studios. When my work was submitted from Pat Robertson's group to Disney, it was submitted through people he had in place, Ned and Judy Nankovich, at uh, the East Coast at Virginia Beach, uh, Robinson's organization. They got top positions in the story development departments of both Disney and Universal Studios instantly. Well, that's pretty interesting. They weren't writers. And so they're in these top positions to launder the work through. And in 1993, when my work went through, it's exactly when Mike Lang was positioned and given executive in charge of strategy for acquisition of intellectual property. Disney is the main culprit. You then saw a lot of these companies like Fox and MGM selling out to Disney immediately, including Warner Brothers was considering it. And so they didn't just go after AT&T. They had all these companies running back to them. In some instances, 10 minute deals that were like cash half and credit off on the other half, instantly done in 10 minutes because they want to be free from accountability for the ripoffs they have done. And so the Disney library and the Miramax films, that strategy was implemented with Mike Lang and Harvey Weinstein under him in charge of how to get the New Jersey warehouse, the boxes there of early 90s scripts, hard copies, as their possessions, they call the Disney library. It's in the Vanity Fair article. And so what you have is they're actually blatantly trying to rip off authors by waiting for their death and to destroy any hope of any court cases actually going through where they can blast you and get your evidence. They will provide honeypot wives, no lie, take them back on holidays or birthdays. They will also take your evidence, pull everything you have, provide their own attorneys with suspended license so that you run out statute limitations. They have all your access to your notes and drafts. And that's what's interesting for the documentary too, Steve, is that Warner Brothers attorneys are on tape saying that they have no working drafts for the Matrix trilogy at all. No working drafts. It's a mute point to ask for discovery. They won't even honor initial disclosures right through the whole process. Fraud on fraud. No statute of limitations. We're coming back after the documentary with a lawsuit. And that is exactly why the lady I just showed you is running for the hills. And if you see the uh, information on her, it says, yes, she's leaving the ship. Now, her reputation is stellar, but she has been a cover-up problem and a person who is just a monster at Warner Brothers with the groomed over image. Wow. So are there any major studios now that aren't um, involved with this, um, like you said, cigar? Mainstream Hollywood? Mainstream Hollywood? No, they're all involved. And they have subsidiaries. They have secondary companies that are also in there. Now, some of these names, like you said about the Truman Show and others, they have been instituted in order to be a mockery. Also, Lionsgate is one of those. Lionsgate was made because a joke about my... Uh, as a writer when I was young in school, it was a joke between me and my professor when I was young about the Lion's Gate project he had me write. So what's interesting is it goes over and then they have their trolls going, well, why would it all be about Tom? He's such an egomaniac. No, actually I'm not. I'm trying to save my last son's life. And it is the contacts from Hollywood on tape for the documentary that are saying that it's about me. It's not my choice to make it about me. If I could rewind the clock and speaking of clocks, 
that is my birthday in Animatrix 7259 with my age 44 after the red. So if it's all about me, it's their doing. They said they put me in my own film. This particular writer doesn't want that. If I could rewind the clock, as I said, my two last sons would be alive and I would never have approached Hollywood. Now, have, I'm sure you've questioned why they chose to pick you uh -huh. over anybody else. And obviously you're very gifted with uh, your writing and your ideas. And to me, it seems they're very envious of it and they're doing whatever they can to not only mock you, but um, in a way preserve you with their, um, I guess, lack of imagination in their films. Well said, that's exactly it. In fact, this piece right here, they said, Bonaventure is on, on record right here. He's on record online, Bonaventure, the man I pitched to, Steve, who says that he discovered and shepherded the Matrix story. He was so excited after the pitch session of this work that he ran to a bank in New York and said he had the greatest piece ever. He told me it was revolutionary. That's why they called the one series of revolutions. But in that, he says he shepherded and discovered and was the few that actually understands it. That's true. He is. But here is the copyright. And as I said, right for uh, viewers, that there's the date of this version, 1998, that was used on set in 1999 to make the Matrix. Now, some people will argue, their, their insiders try different argues, arguments, suggesting that audiences are stupid. That's their plan. That's how Spielberg views them and views them and uh, portrays them in his works. Like Ben in Black, where there's drooling on the couch with no idea what's going on when men are breaking in to take in their home. Weapons from the back wall, they're staring at a comment, right? Well, what's interesting is they try to claim that audiences are dumb and at the same time, they're arguing that, yeah, this is the greatest work. It's revolutionary. There's 190 plus images and concepts that were lifted off the work. And that's why there's a 20 foot rule on the set in Matrix that if you're within 20 feet, you're fired. And you're not supposed to see this particular screenplay in hand. But this actually has the tech also, Neuralink, everything else. It has the jacks, the neck. The Chomsky said they want to do for real. In fact, in 2003, on the set of the second and third installment of Matrix in 2003, uh, when they were doing Animatrix also, when that clock face that shows my birthday on it was put in, and others, uh, Joel Silver is quoted in the article as saying, we hope we used up the rest of the story. Uh, when we watch the rushes, we hope it'll tie together. Well, first of all, two questions right there. If you actually bankrolled a proven script that you made, and went into production without risk when you have union people on set being paid astronomical wages as, in, as a group. Why would you take a risk making it up as you go along and say you hope it ties together at the end? Wouldn't you know before you bankrolled? And wouldn't the investors know that it was worth something before you bankrolled that project? You wouldn't get on set and hope that it tied together at the end. And in fact, the Wachowskis are quoted and they're actually saying this on uh, videos on YouTube you'll see them saying that everybody on set said to blow up the matrix. Well, why was there a debate about it? If you had a finished script, you didn't, did you? You were making it up off of mine with a visual storyboard in hand, making it up as you go along, which they did for matrix four, stupid, horribly done. And then they, then they write it down after they shoot it. So the actors are left with double duty. Not only they're not allowed within 20 feet of the Wachowskis, they also are supposed to improvise what they're told to say. And you have a lot of the quotes coming from the script itself, from the original work here, is actually quoted because the actors were on the fly, under pressure, and they actually decided to use the actual words, then sprinkle on others. And it's incredible how badly it's done where they mix in, the director, uh, Wachowskis mix in what they're familiar with as they do this making up process, and they simplify every sequence of scenes. Yet they argued that everybody said to blow up the matrix at the end, and they kept the exact ending the exact ending that's in this piece that makes no sense if you take out the relationship of a little girl and Neo. By taking out the relationship of that, it makes no sense. The ending makes no sense. Joel Silver corrects that in Oblivion. After our case was thrown in 2014, Disney, Disney, of course, hands Oblivion to Joel Silver, the only one that's going to receive it, no other contestants. And what's interesting is they stopped work on the novel. They didn't need it anymore because our case was thrown by provided attorneys with suspended license that were all classmates from the University of Berkeley. So what you have is that Oblivion has my brother's and sister's names that bought by the Brian Fitzpatrick and Disney, Jack and Julio, the main characters. And you have the field of pods of the little girl pointing at the end to her daddy restored. And that's what happens in the Immortals.
So each of the defendants did their work and took works and did those because they each had their views of what they wanted. They couldn't get along on set. So after the case is thrown, they announce immediately getting rid of any cover um, materials that would be cover stories for here's where it comes from, such as the Oblivion novel, Canned for Good. The uh, Wachowskis did Sense8 announcing within the week the case was thrown in 2014. They announced we had something so big it's too big to write down. Seriously? As a writer, Steve, does that make any sense that you would approach a company saying, I don't have anything, but it's too big to write down. But yeah, thanks for the million dollars to produce it. Netflix. Yeah. It's like more. saying, yeah, I, I have this great idea, but I need uh, 200 million for it. That's right. But I can't tell you about it yet because it's so grand of an idea. That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And Elysium was the same thing that Warner Brothers take was, and it even had the download of the memories on the back and everything. It had everything in it. So what you have, even though the picture in hand dropping at the end, the going to the other place, and they, got, they picked the guy from Di District 9, Bloom Comp or whatever, to do it. And he said he was wanted to do the project because he loved the idea of the helicopters flying by with the barbed wire fences with the people that were segregated from a different society. That's from my work. So what is he what is he talking about? His own work? He loves the scene of his own work? No, he's talking about the scene that's in the, the piece. And in fact, Matt Dam I think it was Matt Damon in um, Inception wasn't shown a script. He was shown a visual storyboard. And that's how the Wachowskis lifted it for Marvel and Disney and Warner Brothers visual storyboards. So Matt Damon was in Interstellar. Interstellar Leonardo, yeah. Leonardo DiCaprio was in Inception. So that's Just been they both that. they both were shown storyboards. Thank you for clearing that up because it gets confusing. But yeah, they were both shown and they were talking about how they were shown storyboards. They were not shown a script. In fact, when the Wachowskis went to Will Smith, they didn't show him a script. They dialogued like groupies, sci-fi groupies, and just dialogued on like an ongoing dialogue to Will Smith about how cool it's gonna be. Where's the script? Where's the beef? Where's the script? No, mm -hmm. they didn't have one, they had mine. And Will Smith turned the project down for that reason, because he thought they were idiots. They weren't showing him a script. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and to uh, touch on the, um, the Matt Damon stuff with Interstellar, so that, that was kind of a, uh, a point in the film when he gets introduced, felt a little bit out of place, and also near the end with the Library of Memories. Oh, God, it makes me so mad about the library of memories because that's Christopher Nolan who failed. His professors told him he failed. He was going to fail as a scriptwriter in his classes when he was taking classes. And he ends up amazed. He ends up at Universal Studios, which is exactly where my work was sent besides Disney through Robertson's contingency. And there he is, has a son named Sean like mine at Universal Studios and does the rip off after rip off and mocks it and Interstellar. It is such annoyance that he has the things in there, including the library of memories done so badly. They just over jack it and overdo it. And it's done so badly. Just like in um, Elysium where they have the, the thing on the back is supposed to be like a mole. I have it a mole on the back of the deck. It looks like a mole implanted, not a big box. How are you going to do a covert, covert break-in to another society segment as a guy with a, with a box on the back of your head? Just ludicrous insanity, poor level podunk idiots in the industry are the ones that are used to rip off the work because they want people loyal in-house. The Wachowskis failed at everything they did. Painting, contracting, dropped out of school. Their mom, their mom said all they did was ever watch video games. How are they being wined and dined by Dina Laurentiis? Uh, at Warner Brothers being told they're going to have beautiful women, success, um, um, you know, uh, be famous. Why are they being wined and dined in the first place when they don't have anything, including, uh, what was it, Carnivore and Plastic Man that still have not been produced, their own original work that still have not been done. Nobody wants it, even though they peddled hard, even with their fame. And what's interesting is you look at Dino Laurentiis who wined and dined him. He's on the copyright with the Wachowskis on Assassins. But when it comes to my title, De Laurentiis, his production companies, Paradise Films, the same one that's on there with the Wachowskis is Paradise Films. Here's Paradise of Films again. What's the title? The Immortals. What's my title? The Immortals. Yep. 
Now, um, I've also kind of overlooked a few things that were actually very obvious if um, I was paying a little more attention to a little a few months ago. But Christopher Nolan's first legit, I guess, as far as you can say, entering Hollywood, his first film made in Hollywood was uh, called Memento. And it has two of the actors from the original Matrix film. And um, if that's not enough of a connection between the two and then going all the way to Interstellar, it shows that he's been involved in this ring, this circle, this whole time. That's right. And you know what the most infuriating part of Interstellar is for me as the author? The Wachowskis left out the best scene. I said it over and over when this all first started happening. I kept saying that it's not the best scene. What was the best scene in the original screenplay? The best scene they did not take because they took the relationship out of Neo and his daughter. See, Neo and his daughter, that's the relationship that makes a satisfying ending. That's why everybody said blow up the Matrix. But the Wachowskis kept the exact ending. It doesn't make any sense having a little girl at the end. And they say she's just a subplot. What was interesting in the original work the relationship between the father and daughter is absolutely essential, essential. That scene right here with the little girl and Jim Reese, Neo, where he goes to see her in the future after she's aged and she's been 70 years without him, Steve. And she go, he goes to see her and he gets told to leave. He runs down the hall, hospital staff op apprehend him. And what happens is, throw the phone away. She dies in his arms. She's 76 years old, the mind of a six-year-old as he had left her when he was first being uh, frozen in the pods to be brought back in our time. He's told by the Smith agent he's not allowed to see any family members because the architect has a Smith agent bringing him back. The Wachowski's got it all wrong. It's supposed to stimulate the mind of the architect. And so that beautiful scene between the father and the daughter, the daughter aged and he hasn't aged, Christopher Nolan in Interstellar bastardizes. There's no feeling. There's no love. There's no connection at all. In fact, the daughter who is aged, and it pisses me off as the author, seeing the work bastardized by a failure, Christopher Nolan, a failure writer, just as the Wachowski said they failed as, as writers in the 1995 article and had to leave Hollywood, they said, unless they've got a, a project to direct. Christopher Nolan destroys it by having this woman actress aged acting like she doesn't even notice the dad as a fly on the wall. Just, you know, whatever, brushes them off. Where's the connection? Where's the emotion? Where's the need for that scene in the piece? And it pisses me off. He ruined it. All he did was chew it up, regurgitate it, and spew it out as phlegm to make no sense. But to, what did Joel Silver say? Use up the rest of the story. They don't want our piece coming forward. So yes, I'm pissed. He ruined it. Now, why was that piece there in the original? Because it was about a father writing about his daughter wanting to be united with her, reunited. That's why the little girl Neo relationship is so important. The Wachowskis took that relationship out in Matrix as they did with Assassins. The reason another writer was brought into Assassins by Dean Laurentiis and others is because they ruined the relationships. They didn't want a central sympathetic character, quote, they didn't want a love relationship and they wanted more violence. Exactly what they did to my piece when they got hold of it and got green lighted by Joel Silver to take it after they auditioned with the audition piece, he calls it bound to see if they could at least direct to get the suits to give them the project. And uh, they weren't the first pick for the project. Wendy Wazerstein was the Jewish playwright. And so what happens is you have Joel Silver giving them audition bound. And what did Larry do in audition in bound? What did he do? He decides to name the main character Violet. Violet is my grandmother, my mom's, uh, my dad's mom. And then what does he do in uh, Matrix, the first scene? My high school, my birthday, my dad's name, my name. And what does some of these shills and public in inputs say, or people that are just to input say? Why would they do that? They wouldn't do that. They did. What kind of discussion is that? What level of intellect is that? where you're going, they wouldn't do that. They obviously did. And if the writer who actually wrote the piece, uh, they know that they took it from him, would they not mock in their own device, in their own ripoff, would then they mock that author? If I was a cement mixer, maybe so. If I was the mailman, maybe not. 
but I'm the writer, the original writer with the copyright. And so they're mocking that author. And they took the relationship out of the piece, trying to use it up and profit off it. That destroyed the whole message, which was reunite with my daughter. And you yes. think that's their uh, overall goal is profit besides um, completely trying to destroy your life with all of this? With Wachowski's list. Larry has a vendetta with me. That's why if you look at that phone thing I held up, the red hand on the floor is assassination, dream list assassination, he wants me dead. That's what's been passed over and over. That's why the whole thing about 302s, lock away or hit, hit and runs. And they but want the, you dead because they don't want to be exposed for what they they over their shoulder. Right, they want to get away with this and have other legacy set. A lot in Hollywood is about legacies. So they want it set. They don't need, they think that too many people would suffer a uh, loss of reputation if I succeed and those with me, my team succeed. Well, we're trying to make a better world, but they see it as too many people, even though they're all criminals, like the lady just left Warner Brothers, they see it as too many, uh, shake too many boats on the water. And so what's going on is the Wachowskis actually do not want to have their uh, fame and fortune, the beautiful women, everything else taken from them. So that's their main goal. And that's what, why they put that stuff in the first graphic, including Animatrix with my name across the screen, Tom Park Althaus across the screen, very cleverly done. And they're not alone, alone in the rendering of that. The reason they did that, I was told by the insider from the Warner Brothers story department who told me, he said they did that because they don't understand your work and they wanna be more clever than you. Now, the reason that they thought they could get away with it, their graphic designer explains in her article, uh, Susanna Bulgin, she says that these are stacked entries that the clearance department, they took it through the clearance department of Warner Brothers. So they just stack these entries, high school, birth date, my name, dad's name, all in the same entry, to get the joke through. And she says it's to keep the project interesting for them. It's what the public reasoning is. The private reasoning is they want to be more clever than the author, one up you. That's exactly why Mike Lang at Disney took my uh, provided wife to bed on my birthday after the case was thrown, he, we have the email from him. They struck from our devices, but we have the emails from him saying, Becca moved in with me for 60 days to his mistress patents book in Washington, the Southern California Mike Lang investor. How many Mike Langs are million billionaires in Hollywood? And that it shows his shaving kit on this bed in this unfurnished millionaire mansion. And uh, then the big L out front next to the Chase Bank. So we've got them coming and going. They know that. So you're going to see a main exodus going now of all these baddies because I'm still breathing. And I'm not going to stop. Now, do you think there are other um, people that are or were involved in Hollywood that have spoken up that have been trying to they've tried to take them out, <laughs> but they haven't succeeded yet? Yes, there are. There are a few. And uh, there, now there's been many writers that have been ripped off. But we're in a situation here, Steve, where they stuck all my personal information in over and over because there was a vendetta of uh, uh, bad blood between the industry, the Wachowskis, Jill Silver, Dean Laurentiis, um, even Mel Gibson. There was all that's going on with Counter Reeves. So you've got a den of thieves that don't really make happy bedfellows. And so that's what's going on is that, you know, it boiled down to trying to one up each other on graphics stacked with info. And that's why Man in the High Castle, that's why Terminal List came out with the main character, Jim Reese. Jim Reese is my main character, that's Neo. So what you have right now is a battle to see who could be more clever and also who can one up the other on, on the graphics, stacking entries. Now this is a death sentence for them because if you look at what's in the um, different stacked entries, like look at Minority Report with Steven Spielberg, what an idiotic move. Basically what he's saying is he thought I'd be dead or hauled off on the 302 pre-crime that I'd be hauled off because I was going to commit pre-crime exactly what my sister and brother are paid to say and trying to set up another session where I'm pulled off by SWAT team and psych people. So what you have is this stacked entry such as Minority Report where Captain John Anderton, my dad's name, my dad's rank, and uh, the son is murdered, Sean, my son's name, who was murdered after the piece was rendered in 2002. And that's pre-crime. So Spielberg's committing pre-crime. That's what they're doing. And so what's interesting is that in the Philip K. Dick novel, Minority Report, where Philip K. Dick said he didn't want his work altered, after his death, which is a strategy of Mike Lang at Disney, after his death, Spielberg does alter it dramatically. Captain is not the rank of the main character Tom Cruise plays in the Philip Dick K. Dick novel, but it is my dad's name, my dad's rank. Also, Sean, the son of the uh, Sean being murdered, being the catalyst for why uh, pre-crime is going to happen, where Tom Cruise's character should be put in stasis. 
the 302 basically. Uh, in the Philip K. Dick novel, there is no Sean, there is no son murdered. That is not the cause of why there's a pre-crime. So that is totally put in all by Spielberg, stacked. Sean, my son, John, my dad, Captain is rank and the pre-crime. And after Sean is murdered, I'm hauled off on 302 attempts, just like Tom Cruise's character. Well, pre-crime. yeah, I was, I was gonna ask you about Philip K. Dick with his, um his short story that they based Minority Report off of, if I it bought was any it. different from yeah. it. Because oh, it's totally. been a while. It's been a while since I, I looked into it. I bought it, combed through it, and uh, highlighted it. Spielberg totally twisted it to be the Tom Althaus story. Wow. Now, you, you're aware of Philip K. Dick giving um, a testimony on what he believes our reality is. Mm-hmm. Have you seen that? Or he- Not yet. All I did yeah. was I bought the different books and uh, like Man in the High Castle too to see what was added by the other side. And boy, was it something, the graphics and things. But no, I didn't see his testimony. But I, I know that they have done him wrong. They have done him wrong. His wishes have not been honored at all. In fact, there's this book that's just insane. That's, um, uh, I have it right here. I'm going to hold this up where it's basically an apology, uh, not not actually an apology, but it's a, right here. This book is all these different morons, I'm gonna say morons, that are writing why Philip K. Dick might like how they made all the changes and then their opinions on it. They hijacked his work. And so, no, he did not want this. this like, we think Philip K. Dick would be pleased with what we did, even though he said he didn't want changes. No, he wouldn't be. I guarantee you he's not going to be pleased. Just like I'm not pleased with uh, what uh, Christopher Nolan did. Ruined the scene. Now the scene can never be done with the right... Mm. It, that was a scene the Wachowskis didn't take. That beautiful scene between father and daughter, where the daughter ages and the man... Look at it again in Interstellar and look how badly they ruined it and how juvenile the Library of Memories is. That's not a Library of Memories. No, just, they made it kind uh, of like guitar strings. No, it's just... It's, playing it's, with the light. Yeah, it was really... They're mocking the works. They're mocking it and they're mocking audiences and audiences need to realize that they're not serving the public. They're serving their own in-house jokes while they have their brandy and cigars mm. and making a profit off of people and ripping off writers who actually are trying to write as a service for humanity and to make exciting films. They're just farming us like bleeding the bear for Chinese medicine. Yeah, I see that also happening with um, J.R. Tolkien in his, um, well, it's not his Amazon series, but they made a lot of changes to what his um, original story was about. And um, I am not watching the new one. I've seen stills and whatnot, but I'm sure if he was alive, it either A, wouldn't have happened. Yeah. Or B, he would be completely devastated and we would not be hearing the end of this from him about well, see, how they bastardized his work. You just hit something so important, Steve. And this needs to be remembered, and I think I'm going to tell the documentary team, too, we want to put this in, because you just hit something so important. Why buy off family members? Why give them outstanding rewards, such as black tie dinners with engraved invitations, trips to the Mediterranean, London, Caribbean, you know, you, know, you name it. They, they get to go wherever they, you know, and then Jimmy Fallon show appearances, as my sister gets. Florida Congress, her picture held up. President of psych people in Pennsylvania. Top psych person in Pennsylvania. All from the FBI, lifelong FBI from California. And Pennsylvania Congressman Brian Fitzpatrick, who destabilized Ukraine. Why pick the family members? Because then they'll greenlight you ripping off the work after the demise and death of the author who would never want it. See, you get into the family and you claim it that way. You say, well, the family wanted this because they're now enjoying cocktails, limo service, a beachfront home after we dealt with them. And that's exactly the plans they have in place. Buy off the family get the work. That is what the strategy is boiled down to. After the death of the author and his sons. See, they don't want living male heirs claiming the work or being a testimony to the goodness of their fathers. 
They don't want that. And that's why they're struck that site. The site just got struck. My site, redpillrising.org is struck. They don't want what the video shows my son made a father's journey shown. They're actually trying to say he doesn't exist, Steve. Aiden, who's 15, going to varsity soccer, playing the piano, doing art, unbelievable, going to engineering, taking college credit courses when he was a sophomore. The kid's a genius and he's a writer too. They don't want Aiden testifying that his dad was a good guy. They got to villainize us and make us into evil people. In fact, Sophia Stewart's been spouting around that Tom is the evil one. And her group actually came up with a whole prophecy binder thing, a whole prophecy thing. Now, they made it now that says that Sophia Stewart is the rising sun of the heavens and that Tom Althouse is the evil one. Come on, people. For yeah. those that are going to be watching this later, Sophia Stewart was the first, to be the mother the per, yeah the person that warner brothers put forth to take play. credit for that's the right. original work to be the first claimant in-house yeah. failed writer out of usc the same usc where jill silver took his director failed writer director to be the one that would do uh um uh, alder carbon so what's interesting is they are trying to use up the rest of the story and what's alder carbon's uh main thrust or theme that the rich in the future have immortality and the poor is used as pawns that's my work so after joel silver gets all my materials all my drafts everything else through this corrupt court process right when they've already thrown the case then what happens is he announces all this work and there's my theme considered the greatest sci-fi concept ever through netflix where the attorneys for warner brothers ended up and you'll probably see this lady who just left warner brothers go to now to rip off work Netflix has become a ripoff laundering machine. Oh, yeah. And there's so much content out there now. I don't know if you can even call it content at this point. They're just churning stuff out that's not, I mean, it's, it's not appealing to a yeah. majority of people. But somehow, because of streaming views, and people can leave their laptop just running all day. And it doesn't <laughs> really mean that people are watching it. No, no. They have a whole system in place to even to promote the attorneys that do the wrong and have it look like they're just loved. You know, it's unbelievable how far this has gone. But the work you're seeing right now is as valuable as expectorated phlegm on the sidewalk of New York. Yeah, I'd have to agree. I mean, it, there has not been quality <laughs> art films that I've wanted to see that have come to my attention in the past couple of years. Even in the past decade, the, uh, the pool of influential film and uh i guess serials has really shrunk for me and um i mean it's a, it's such a small complaint from my end compared to what you're going through but i mean it it does seem like they're they are out of ideas they are they are they're but see, just trying to make a quick buck and um yeah, use up the rest of the stories use up the ideas say we're going to use that would the Wachowski say, we want to do Jackson Neck for real? Well, if they had written it, they wouldn't have said that. But the thing is that what's interesting is um, other authors like myself, especially myself, I'm able to tell them, and it's on tape with the Disney contact, I've got 15 other screenplays now. 15 other screenplays better than The Matrix. And they're like, how do we know? Everything's been done in the sun. I'm like, what do you think I've been doing since 93? And they're like, you know, well, we need to see it. I'm like, no, you won't see it. And that's how I outplayed them, knowing what they wanted profiling them basically and i said if anything happens to my last surviving son then um you will never see this work it'll be destroyed they said you can't do that now that's following them saying we know you're concerned for your last son's safety to keep me from doing interviews so you see the interplay that's on that tape we know you're concerned for your last son's safety you better shut up turned into if anything happens to my son you'll never see these screenplays you want interesting interplay that'll be an historic tape and that's pretty much created a stalemate and kept you and your family safe for the time being with it's, having that as collateral your your scripts that they haven't seen yet that they want right that aiden had suggested bury in a trash bag without staples so metal touch detectors can't follow them you know we had to resort to this so they know that if they do their fbi raid on us which they've been threatening over and over i got email after email and text after text that they're going to be sending on these players that are inside that do the harming uh, what happens is uh, they can't, they know that it's buried and they'll never find it. You can't use a metal detector or anything. How are you going to detect paper in a plastic bag? 
So it's like, yeah. And so we know how to play them and we have. And that makes a more exciting story too, which they're very afraid of the story. Their attorneys in Warner Brothers, or attorneys in Hollywood have said the real life story is bigger than the Matrix itself. So that's what they're thinking, the documentary, the real life story. That's why this back and forth, Steve, of offers to be script doctor, but you won't get credit for your work. You'll be wealthy, super wealthy with beautiful women. Uh, and the pass. What I want to do is finish the work and finish the jobs. So this is not to other families and sons and daughters are safe and elderly are respected. That scene that Christopher Nolan, bouncing back to that, that scene that he bastardized and destroyed was supposed to lift the idea of honoring our elderly, valuing our elderly. How dare you destroy that? Simply so you can take credit for the idea. So, yeah. Yeah, that scene was very dry the way it was Horrible. executed. Horrible. Does it seem like it serves any purpose? It's just... No. Other than the um, the conflated ego of Nolan and him wanting to be edgy with uh, do, doing, uh, I don't know, this content. I mean, you, I don't know if you've watched Tenet, his last no, movie that he I made. Watched. I, I can't stomach Nolan. It's gotten to a point with him where it's very obvious there's, no narrative arc in his film. Sure. I mean, it really feels like he's just trying to make the next um, fatty uh, contemporary piece. Like, it doesn't have to make sense, but it's new and, oh, we haven't seen this before, but it doesn't make much sense. Right. And that's, it, it's it, gotten it, really tired with him with that stuff. That's what they do. They want to have something that's shocking. You can imagine them in the boardroom passing these things around. And go, this would be really cool. Stick this in. That's not the way you create great art. You have no follow through happening. You have no trail. You're simply cut and pasting like solidarity. Apart mm -hmm. from most part, it doesn't create a good song or a piece or orchestra piece. It doesn't. It's there's no flow. It's simply tacked in. This is clever. This is shocking. Well, then just do shorts like the Animatrix, where they tried to use up the rest of the work on set that they didn't get to use off the script in hand, which I'm told by the fight choreographer was in hand along with the story storyboard. So what you have is in the future, though, great films are going to come forward. And we're going to be looking for stories as we form studios, looking for stories that have been brushed aside and restoring work. We're going to take them back on their idea of, oh, we, the story's used up? No. We're gonna allow original work to be seen the way it was supposed to. I think that will be a boon for intellectual audiences that use critical thinking to see exactly how the work was supposed to be. That will also be a propelling um, bounce board forward for great work. And like my plan is to give my copyright, once I win name credit back, give my copyright over to every man, woman and child, except for those that were part of the rip off process. So they can also do their takes on it and propensity at propound creative thought. I want to open up what Disney shut down. When they took Mickey Mouse and said, no, we're not going to follow copyright law. We want an exception where we own them forever. No, that we're not going to allow that. We're going to reverse that where copyright law starts to do what it was supposed to do. While they're trying to get rid of copyright law, we're going to try to enforce it where copyright law will be what it was meant to be. The author owns it for a period of time where it allows him to bring to fruition his ideas and work. And then the public is allowed to take it from there and the ideas that will generate and boom from there. That's the way it's supposed to work. Not allow businesses to rip off uh, individual families and make a fortune off of destroying their lives and running statues and latches out by harassing and killing and murdering and whatever to, in order to steal and theft in order to make sure that latches are run at the same time, then claim that we slept on our rights. We didn't yeah. slept on our rights. We were dodging bullets right and left from people who had all the power and mega monopolies to do it, who had the alphabet boys also backing them in the process. It's been a relationship between Disney and the FBI from go. Yeah. I'm thinking about um, the Batman uh, copyright <laughs> I know that's um, supposed to be running out in, a, in like the next few years, but um, you had mentioned about his family going through a similar horrible thing. Bill Fingers died in his apartment, if I understand, um, alone, rotting, 
like they smelled the smell and that's how they knew he had, was dead. His son saw no justice. He tried and ended up a pauper. And then you have the grandchildren benefiting because of our situation. Marvel Comics, Disney, Warner Brothers. What happened was we were told by the honeypot wife, Aiden and I, my son and I, that they had something severe going on when they were throwing our situation. So they allowed them to get name credit at that point. And the same players involved in us kept us under wraps. They figured we were the bigger fish to keep down. So what's interesting is the Fingers family finally saw a sense of justice with the grandchildren getting red carpet treatment and everything. They said this, it changed from like gray skies to silver clouds overnight. But that was done because they had to deal with us. Same players. Marvel Comics is the one owned by Disney that works with Warner Brothers. The Wachowskis were supposed, supposed to first launder the work through the Immortals through. So this screenplay was first supposed to be laundered through as a comic series through Marvel with Disney and Warner Brothers. That was the first play. And in fact, Paul Anderson of uh, Cypherman has sent me text after text, email after email. I've got a whole bunch of them giving to the documentary team. Where he's saying, let's do a blend. Let's do a blend. Yes, let's do the Immortals and Cypherman blend. Now, this is while certain people in the public have been brought to, uh, to heel to say, look, uh, Cypherman's the one that was ripped off. No, that was in-house at Warner Brothers Marvel Comics. That's in-house people claiming it's like the Wachowskis and Sophia Stewart. So what you have is, again, in-house claimants being shuffled up in order to take it from the original author. But what's interesting is, look at the emails and the messages coming through. Let's do a blend of Cypherman and Immortals. That achieves nothing. That achieves nothing. That also shows that they know we're winning, that the Immortals being made will blow them out of the water. The call that Sophia Stewart gave me after sights were being struck and interviews being struck, she called bragging about that that very day with Red Pill 78, Michael Jaco, the rest, and Sarah Westall. And so what happens is she calls me bragging about that. And she says, you can't make your work. If you do, if you make the film, the Immortals, there'll be an injunction on it. I said, well, if there's an injunction, it proves we're right. That means there's matchups. We won. We're back in, we win. Then she says, well, you can't, you can't um, make it because nobody's gonna be interested in it. Love it or hate it, people are gonna come to see how the actual story ties together. And that's what's gonna happen with all these other works that have been ripped off. Now, a lot of these works that have been ripped off, Steve, have been hodgepodge, sections taken, sections taken. That's the way these mindless people work in these boardrooms. They'll go like, well, that's a cool idea, stuck that in, let's stick this idea in. It doesn't create a story. That's not a story. It's not born out of the passion for the work. It's simply cut paste. And they keep doing this. That's not creating a living entity, a beautiful piece. That's creating a lab-created, cut-and-paste Frankenstein. It's not going to fly. It's not going to be a great story. Frankenstein is, but not this kind of process. It doesn't create great stories. So, yeah, you're going to see in the future more and more execs running for cover, bailing. And keep in mind what they say about us authors is that we mumble that we're completely insane, parasitic, bipolar one and two, that we're, okay, if we were those things, uh, we wouldn't be able to form a sentence and let alone track thought back and forth to call backs to earlier topics, tie in that flow with what we're talking about. So they'll have, she'll say, he's all over the map. I can't follow him. I'm going to stop watching because he doesn't make any sense. He mumbles. He's all over the place. He talks with a lisp. I'm sorry. I think I'm pretty clear. And I think I have the mind that's been tested it said, gift of genius, the lady said, gift of genius, you have tremendous empathy. So what does my sister do that's bought by Brian Fitzpatrick? Used to be, you know, someone who helped, tears up the diagnosis all the time. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, Mind it's really surprising. Yeah, like how, how all of this is unfolding. But I do uh, agree with you that we're going to be seeing more people jumping ship from Hollywood. Yes, you will. Um, we'll see a lot more of that before we start seeing films that have an opening scroll that says the story has been restored to its original uh, intent by the original author. What you see going forward is like, et cetera, et cetera. There's so much desperation right now. You may see a contingency plan. They're grasping for straws. Now get this. Here's what's been passed down. Get this, I can't even, I can't say this without laughing, but they're now playing the English royalty into the mix. They're so desperate, they're going to watch the English royalty, Queen Elizabeth the rest, start to become more politically involved 
and start to make, you know, suggestions and pronouncements and stuff on a very powerful political level. That's because they're running out of their strings to pull, right? Their leaders have failed in their policies and in their strategies. And I guarantee you in the near future, there's going to be a suggestion for us to head back to a monarchy, that we go back to a centralized, beyond centralized government, a centralized monarchy where we can get control of our world and protect our nation. It's like one step up of suspending our rights. Now that sounds just like, wah, like the Truman Show, you know, like he's like, wah, when the rain's going by him. But I would suggest that certain players that have been positioned as good guys in leadership that we're supposed to be fighting for are going to suggest the idea of longer presidential terms again to get everything in order, be based on popularity and as if they're saving us and head down the road to a monar monarchy. It's a softer way of saying dictatorship. Yeah, it sounds it sounds I mean, I'm laughing myself, but that is how desperate they are to have the strings in control. And that is the elite in their fading heartbeats wanting to have protection of what they've accumulated and owned. It was Goering in World War II that didn't really want to go to war. He didn't want to go to war, Hitler's plan. Why? He didn't want to lose what he had. He had too much to lose. All the art, like Joel Silver said, he doesn't uh, make art, he acquires art. Same thing Goering was saying. He acquired art. He took whatever he wanted from even the Louvre Museum in France. And so he did not want to risk losing his opulence and wealth so he argued basically gently with Hitler, let's not do this big war. That's where we're at right now. They don't want a big war all of a sudden. It's starting to switch where they want to protect and cut free of what they have. There go the new plan to make it so they can get the public to be appeased and allow them to have their opulence and positions that are not threatened. And so, yeah, we're going to see a lot of interesting maneuvers in the near future and suggestions to the public that are supposed to behave themselves and go along with the ideas. Yeah, so there's um, a new studio film by Disney Marvel that was announced um, since the last time we talked. Uh, Captain America sequel. God. And the, sub, the subtitle of it is called New World Order. God help us. Now, how, how much more obvious can they get? This is, I really feel the, the start, like, we'll watch, the or they'll have people watch this film, but they're making this so that they can put on the table what they're about to do. Exactly right. It's their news media for themselves. They joke and, and brag and be clever, they think, and pass around in plain sight what the plans are. What is the work that I've been holding up? The theme of it also, besides the rich in the future of immortality and the poor is used as pawns, it also suggests that a new world order is going to be inevitable. And if that's going to happen, then those of us, such as my character in the film, at least we can try to make it a good one. Let's make it a good one rather than one they have planned. So if it has to be a one world order, let's make it a good one. That's now surfacing as a theme, which the Hollywood gives credit for and says, oh, this man's just saying this now. No. We've been whispering it through art forever. And that's what it is. Now, it infuriates me also that Keanu Reeves hands up that thing about, it's a documentary. Yeah, I whispered through art to try to warn what was going on, what Robertson's plans were deeply connected to the cabal. We have all the stratas connected in the cabal. You know, FBI, CIA, Warner Brothers, Disney, the movie moguls, the banks of England, the Federal Reserve, Robertson's religious right. You have all these other televangelists. You've got the Secret Service, the Pentagon. They're all in it as a cabal in order to make sure the elite, the 1%, have a utopia in the future where they do not lose their wealth and opulence and they protect it and they get rid of the fat, they call us. Well, not those of us that are creative geniuses, they think. We're to be owned, as you said, put in stasis until the time where we can behave ourselves and keep creating so they're not bored. That's how stupid they lay out the future. A different future I envision, Steve, and I think many share it, is a creative one where we have works shown, first of all, like we said, that we're talking about that are going to be the actual work as it was intended, not bastardized by these guys that couldn't pick their nose right, right or left finger. And then we're going to also 
go on to new creativity where a whole world will be able to contribute creativity and it'll have a green light to it. And our news agencies will no longer be private industries for profit. We will have connected to industry, other industries and the FBI and CIA and Pentagon. We will have a news industry that actually is people sharing what they feel is worth seeing openly. And it won't be a YouTube thing where it's owned by the powers to be. It'll be something free and uncensored to show, here's a thought I had, here's an idea. That's how I envisioned the internet when I first pitched Windows to the professors from California, computer profs at Millersville University in 1980, when I pitched the whole Windows thing that then went to Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. They gave them their fortune. And that is a natural development then into the Matrix story and Neuralink and everything else that I came up with. It's not about me. The reason it came to me, Steve, was because I wanted to make a better world for kids, elderly, and others. And that's where we need to be. And that's what I've been telling Disney. You can want power. Great. Fine. Power achieves nothing. The one of power clouds the creative mind. But if you have compassion and approach your work as a service to humanity and all life, then your work will flow brilliantly. You'll be laughing and crying while you're creating because you'll be seeing what the audience is going to see. And that allows you to tap into exactly what their experience is going to be. And so that's where we're heading. The people who actually have the merit, who aren't uh, narcissistic self-seekers like my sister and brother who are bought by the system. That's why they're bought by the system. They are. They're profiled that way. It'll be the rest of us that aren't, that are being called that, that'll create our work free, free range. And you watch what happens. These studio heads, these studios will go down the tubes. Disney, the rest will fall. They'll make last minute deals with us. And they have been to try to come on board and be the creative content people behind the scenes as script doctors. Well, that means we rip off work. No, thank you. Uh, Let's have a change around. Yeah. Did, um, did Mel Gibson start off with being a part of this club and then try to break out or has he always been kind of on the fringe of everything? In My understanding that Mel Gibson doesn't have much of a backbone. Really, um, his vices show that too. The alcohol is not something that shows a strong backbone, I'm sorry to say. When you abuse it, you don't have a backbone. Yeah. And Mel Gibson was basically this. The real, I mean, beyond the image that Hollywood groomed of Mel Gibson, this is Mel Gibson, the needy child. Give me anything you got. I'll take anything you have. That's Mel Gibson. That's why Mel Gibson was such the candidate to be brought in to be the plausible story how the uh, Wachowskis end up in Hollywood. <laughs> Mel Gibson discovers failed writers who did nothing but read comic books and watch sci-fi, who flunked out of college, failed at their painting business. And he he's was claiming he's, to disco have discovered them? He, yes, he's, he claims he discovered in, uh, the Wachowskis and brought them to Dino Laurentiis. Please, 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 why? Out of anybody in the population on planet Earth, why would the Wachowskis be picked when they failed at everything, as their mom said? And why would Dean Laurentiis follow up with that one and die? No, they were picking failed writers like Sophia Stewart and the other people they bring out of USC to be uh, in-house, to be the plausible candidates to claim so they can have to work in-house. That's all they're doing. They use failed writers that way. It's called the D-player D, D backdoor in Hollywood. If you can't make it in the business, you're a D-player brought in to serve that function. It's illegal. It's, it's what my sister is being used for. And rewarded grandly. She's a low, was the non sharpest tool in the shed, we'd say, out of my entire family. And she's the one they bought in. They bought in to do all this dirty work now. And she said she's not about peacemaking now. She's about power and success and image, spray on tans, maid service, bonded teeth, everything. And she's an unlicensed elementary school counselor. Ask any elementary school counselor if they have the funds to have maid service. They even do their floorboards in a mansion where they get to travel to uh, Caribbean, to uh, London in the same year with New York and San Diego and get to have all these appearances and black tie dinners. Ask them if they're able to qualify for that as an unlicensed elementary school counselor. So with... Um the way Hollywood is set up and from what I've personally noticed through looking at the entire archive of Hollywood, what gave Mel Gibson a pass with being able to create the passion of the Christ in <laughs> such a large Hollywood Great like question. that? The answer is right here. If you look online, they'll say, oh, his case was, he lost his case. It's only about Hitler and Christ. 
See, it's not. The only historic figures that work for the architect, that's why they home own the architect, is that character. The only character that can balance the equation with identical figures at the end that we give our free will over to in Judeo-Christian society is the Christ. So he's just brought in to be plausible characters that fit historically to balance the equation. So they take that and run with that. Now, Gibson does The Passion of Christ because this work was written to see if Christ could be introduced to mainstream Hollywood, and it did work. So he seized on it. That's why that. And what's interesting is throughout his films too, say Braveheart, isn't it interesting that the character, the Braveheart character carries that, that uh, little tapestry from his wife that reminds her of her, thinks he sees her all the time and hears her, drops it at the end when he dies. Uh, that right there is all right here. Mel Gibson was one of the biggest bastards in the ripoff and was very willing because this is really Mel Gibson. Instead of this, he's this. I'll take anything you have. Give me anything you have. And when I get drunk, I'll scream at the Zionists and get enraged at them. But then I'll apologize later. I was drunk, <laughs> but I know what's going on in the industry. But I'll take anything they have. I'm your boy. He is a backbone, sp no backbone, spineless gimp. Yeah, well said. I mean, considering everything that we just talked about, that's just, that's disgusting. He is disgusting. <laughs> and, Nothing he, has, he had the chance to really expose everything. and He chose Image to just take the easy path out. Image is everything for him, just like my sister now. Image. When the cabal gets a hold of you and they buy the weakest links, then they they groom them and regroom you and groom your image, bonded teeth, you know, you name it, spray on tans. And my sister gets them all the time. How does she afford it? How is her daughter going to the University of Richmond, one of the most expensive schools? When, uh, yeah, it's like, what's your income? Anyway, so that's where we're at. We've got, you know, Keanu Reeves being groomed whenever they groom them heavily. The Wachowskis didn't even want Keanu Reeves. Keanu Reeves was brought in by the suit saying, you will use him. You will use him. Because Keanu Reeves' career needed to be saved, my piece was what saved Keanu Reeves' career. And he knows exactly what's going on with the Immortals. He freaked out when he heard the title through a contact. He knows what he did. And so now he's worried about his legacy, trying to turn it around while he parties with his biker friends. He's trying to turn it around and um, make it that he's like this Shogun good guy, you know, Japanese good guy. You know. The character in the film, the original character in the Immortals, yes, is like that. But Keanu Reeves, you are not. You don't deserve to be even near the script. And has has he done anything over the past few months in terms of- They've been, they've been announcing that he'll be doing more things. And it's like, it, it, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. The guy should never have gone into acting. I'm sorry to say, last pick. I would never pick him for my piece. There's one of the greatest insults I ever had was Keanu Reeves being in the piece. Yeah, that yeah. recent um, part three of the Bill and Ted series, I was really surprised with, um, well, I guess I shouldn't have been surprised, but his acting in that third one th was not the same as the other two. And I guess that goes to show you that he's not an actor. But you know what he does on set? George Carlin talked about it. What he does on set is he jokes around with his buddies, clowns off, does butt jokes and butt slapping, and then he's called for the shot. He's like, oh, okay, all right, and runs up and does his shot and goes back to clowning around. It's not an actor. He's a goofball. Yeah. yeah. Kind of, I mean, it threw me off with that third one, and I've only watched it once, but um, it just seemed like he was phoning it in there, but sure. has he been phoning it in this whole time? Probably. So. Probably so. I mean, he did that Shakespeare piece. Yes, my yeah. God. My God. I think Shakespeare rolled in his grave. I remember I mean, people acting, yeah. but in my uh, classes laughing about that one. My God, it was horrible. Yeah. I, I, I could do Keanu Reeves acting if I, if I kill all my brain cells. I could do it too. I could do like, I feel we should go and get redress for what has just happened. Let us hearken forward. It's like, I think that's even better than he did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know how to show no feeling. Keanu Reeves the master. I'll give him that, the master of it. Yeah, I, I want to bring it back around to sure. the Truman Show. Absolutely. Um, I studied the script back uh, when I was at Columbia College, Chicago. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, the writer Peter Weir. Um, I think he had a, like several drafts because I had uh, rented out a, I guess a previous draft, but not a shooting script draft, where there was a scene with, um, I guess when, when the the honeypot wife mm -hmm. that's in that movie, right? She's starting to talk with Truman in the kitchen about a cereal, right? Brands of oh, knives oh, and okay. stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. That escalates in this previous script, uh, draft of a script where they go into um, the bedroom and there's a water bed, and that whole thing was cut out of the the final movie with them being in, in a water bed and it being stabbed and everything. But um, there were scenes in in that movie where they're trying to escape the. Um, the enclosure that he's in right and they're going like driving out into the forest and all that and in the earlier draft it really felt like there was more to be expanded upon and they didn't do so i agree, I agree. and especially the way that that film ended with um just having people being like oh what's what's next on tv um i mean even from when i first watched it to today I, I would want more out of a, a conclusion to that story of mm -hmm. either that that dome being destroyed, mm -hmm. of seeing a conclusion, not that they're going to uh, draw somebody else into that role of Truman and start the process all over again, which I think is a possibility, but they left the whole thing open-ended. Right. And I guess the point I'm trying to get at is I... I also believe Peter Weir was a, an original writer. It turns out he's borrowing and doing the bidding of the studios like right, all right, these right. other people are doing. Right, right, right. But, um, well, that's the thing. It's, it'd be, you see, you just hit something important, too, is that people would watch The Truman Show. Um, I think they would watch it the way it could be done, another variation of it. A better yeah, variation. I think, yeah, Just, and well, well, yeah, that's where I have been at for quite some time now, especially with the Matrix trilogy. Oh, God. And I have not watched the fourth one, and I'm no, I'm don't. I, I'm not either. going to either. No way. I but you, you really hit a good point with that. That we, uh, our creative minds, when we go and watch these films, we're seeing it in a way where how we could have done it better mm -hmm. or how we think the the person putting it together uh what, what we think that their intention was right and so that's when we start filling in the blank spaces and like oh well maybe it meant this stuff that's not actually addressed or or verbally spoken on screen or shown visually on screen our minds are trying to fill in the blanks because we we see and we uh, hear that there's these gaps in the story and we're trying to just make it make more sense in our heads. And I think that's where I've been with a lot of these films that I used to look up to a lot. Yeah. And well, so you, I'm yeah. like, wait, like this concept of this character from this one story of this franchise I haven't actually heard anybody else talk about it in the manner that I'm talking about it. Mm -hmm. And in a way like that, that leads to what you were saying with how we're filling in the blanks for the most part to what we consider is, I mean, let's say something's very mediocre and we watch it and we're like, Oh, well maybe it's a great film because of, this or that, but it's actually your ideas that you're putting into this already finished right. product. Right. So, yeah, I'm not sure where I was going with that, but that well, I mean, it, it, opens up, it opens up some in the gaps part. It, yeah. it opens up some things for me because what what you just hit upon too for me is that like when uh, District Nine was done, you know, uh, and they moved into um, um, the follow up one, uh, Interstellar, I think it was. Uh, Neil Neil Blumkamp, uh, he said he was quoted as saying that writing for him was like pulling teeth. 
So in the show in a visual storyboard, you know, rather than a script. So, and he said that, you know, like I said, that the uh, one scene in my screenplay was what he was drawn to and why he wanted to do the work. Then you didn't write it. If you wanted to do the work and was drawn to a certain scene, you didn't write it. And so what you're seeing is on these films, a lot of times, even Matrix, you'll see a lot of different writers listed, right? Yeah. And you'll claim, well, you're only allowed to list two according to the rules of the, you know, guild. It's like Writer's Guild. I'm like, well, interesting. Let me just tell you, you can't have a great film. I'm going to say this. It can be debated. Sure, open up debate. With all these different writers in the kitchen. The best work comes from a single mind doing the layers, navigating all the layers and controlling that process with compassion and passion involved. That's where your good work comes from. You know, a writer of a great novel doesn't go, hey, guys, come on over, have some beers and we'll write a novel together. It doesn't work. You've got to track all this stuff and be tracking layers at the same time. So when you see Hollywood with all these writers and brother teams, it doesn't work. The Wachowskis say, oh, we have a symbiotic relationship. No, you don't. You're ripping off work and you're just cut pasting. When the original work will be shown again from all these different ripoffs of different, different authors that were ripped off, wait till you see how it's done in a linear fashion with layered thinking with actual writers that had the passion for the baby, for their work. Not teams of writers. Hollywood's figuring that out. That's why the entreaties now and the offers to, you know, be a script doctor. <laughs> no, I've got 15 other screenplays better than The Matrix. And yeah, if my son survives, when he survives, I'll release those for the world because that's the world I want him to be a part of. If he doesn't survive, I'm destroying, I'm burning him. And Hollywood, Disney knows that. And they're the ones that say, you can't do that. Interesting. We found their Achilles heel. We found what matters to them most. We found what affects them the deepest. And that's the work they could profit off of. What did Joel Silver say? I don't create work, I acquire it. Well, how are you gonna acquire it if the rest of us just boycott you? And we're no longer letting you see our work if we don't have a world where we're allowed to operate freely and have freedom. And I'll call out what Mel Gibson said when he died dropping the picture, ripping off my scenes. Freedom. Not Mel Gibson's freedom, where he's bought as a boy just ripping off the world of writers, but actually those of us that want to contribute to a beautiful world for the elderly and for youth. And we're going to do it, and we're going to finish the job. And we got them now. One of the insiders from TMZ said, Tom, you were smart enough to write The Matrix. You're smart enough to follow the trail. And I'm like, yeah, that's good. I'm going to use that. Thank you. May I use that? It's like, yeah. Yeah, we are. Those of us that are writers, that are gifted geniuses, that have empathy, there's no stopping us. We're going to do it right. We're going to do it well. And people can count on us to follow through. We're not what Warner Brothers and other studios propound is that everyone's dark and everyone's evil at their core. No, not all of us are. Some of us actually have a heart. And that heart doesn't make for weakness. That heart can be some of the greatest strength ever seen in history. And we'll have that courage matched with it. And that compassion become powerful dedicated we won't swerve we can't be bought we won't turn and we'll finish the job yeah i agree i i think that's um exactly what we need to focus on going forward is knowing that we have the power to to change our present and the future mm -hmm. for the better in the documentary you're going to hear that you're going to see I'm so excited about the documentary. Oh my God. It, it, usually documentaries will hit something like the Bill Fingers family, the Batman family documentary, not Bill and me. It, sh it shows this tape being played that, okay, there's an excerpt of a tape that leaves it open that maybe he was ripped off. And that becomes the catalyst for the whole thing to turn. We don't have just a tape. We have tapes and evidence and copyrights and you name it and emails and ripped off and recordings. I mean, it's unbelievable what we have. So, so this is, is going to be the whole way. Is Bob Kane kind of like the same role as what the Wachowski brothers are playing right now. Give me the background of Bob Kane. I believe Bob Kane's the or claimed to be the original creator of Batman. Interesting. In Bob Kane, if I'm not mistaken, in the um, in the um, oh, what was it? The in, the documentary. He is admitting on tape. That's the tape cassette where he admits on tape that it was shared project. Basically, it was a shared concept. So. That became the catalyst. That one piece of evidence really was what it was. That whole documentary centers around, basically. And so what's interesting in ours, you'll see, like, yeah, yeah. So Bob Kane, 
he knew what he was doing and he knew he was profiting off. So yes, he was like the Wachowskis from what I understand. Wow. Yeah. The, so I wanted to just clarify that as well, because you, you this is, I think the, one of the first times I'm hearing of Bill Fingers. So I'm going to have to look into that a bit more. Bill Fingers. Yeah. His, he was just, he was destroyed. Totally taken advantage of. They figure in Hollywood, the nice guys, they actually, the honeypot wife actually said this. I think this is important to hear. The honeypot wife said to me when Aiden said, she's switching sides. She wants to be on our side. She wants to pick the winning throne, 48 ways of power, whatever. Uh, it says, pick the winning throne, play like you're loyal to both and then destroy the one that's weakest. That's not going to succeed and act like you're always with the other one and, and weep the benefits. That's what sister's doing. So she had said to us that, Tom, you got to understand it's all about power and that that's the laws of nature. Now, this is important, Steve, I think. She said to me, this honeypot wife under what? Mike Lang of Disney, Hard Weinstein's boss. The whole one in Star Wars the strategy. The, the laws of nature, Tom, she said, is that the weak are food for the powerful. And so if you do not, if you keep showing compassion, they're not going to take you back and in. They'll destroy you. And she was telling me that. She said, if you do go in, they're going to strip me away. She started getting in tears. We're going to strip me away. They won't want me. They'll provide you with another wife. Yeah, right from the horse's mouth on the inside, owned by Mike Lang with a criminal record. How about that? So there you go with their mentality. It is a mentality, a lifestyle of fear. When you're in the cabal, no one's supposed to reveal anything. Who revealed the trail back to Disney in the cabal? Mike Lang. Mike Lang. Because of why? On tape, you heard the Disney contact say, the reason Mike Lang took my wife to bed was because of ego on my birthday. And I said, thank you. Just put a bag on her head. Because what you just did was you just made a trail back to Disney. We would never have known. So Mike Lang, you just revealed the cabal. So you never see Mike Lang in the news. And he has a double now too. So the whole thing with Mike Lang was he revealed the cabal because of his ego. He wanted to be better than the author he was employed to rip off. And so he thought by sleeping with his wife, it'd make him more of a man than the author. And I'm like, take her. There's a beautiful woman in the future who has talent, spunk, and everything else that I'll be with and will be Aiden's mom in the future as this is happening. So have her. I don't want somebody who lied to me with a criminal record, outstanding warrants and everything else that you expunged and had employed to rip me off. No, I think Aiden and I are pretty good for a new person that is actually genuine and fits the bill to celebrate with us as we succeed in this journey. Excellent. Yeah, so... um. I wanted to change the, the topic here real quick um, about how the industry moved from analog filmmaking to digital filmmaking. And um, for, for my comment on this, I do believe that um, using analog film was cre it was uh, turned into a commodity for Hollywood where they were the only ones that were able to afford it to to uh, process and develop film and um, something happened in the past 20 yeah about 20 years or so where everything has been shifting over to digital mm -hmm. and digital is very accessible to those that don't have that type of money that Hollywood does to, right. and, and it's kind of like created a bridge between, um, I guess, essentially the haves and the have nots, mm -hmm. the haves yeah. being the cabal and the have nots being us that have the, the ideas, but we don't have the means to get everything out there, whether it's because there's other people that are preventing that from happening, that are keeping doors closed and, um, or they're out to make sure that they take some of our work. <laughs> mm -hmm. And if not only that, then also flat out destroy us. Now, I, I guess I want to get your um, thoughts on uh, the industry changing from analog to digital. And why do you think they would allow that to happen? And um, whether it could be because of um, it's letting it's letting more people get their ideas out there creatively or um, like you said, they're trying to do away with copyright law where any, what anybody puts up on YouTube or the social media sites, these sites can 
claim it as their own and then use it after the fact. Right. So, um, yeah, I just want to get your thoughts on on that whole transition over to digital. Well, that. right away, I would say, if you look at my situation, what the Wachowskis did to my screenplay, they cheapened the train station scene. They made it a joke. And they, they wanted to cut budget, save on budget. Their book, basically, what they called their Bible, was how to make a billion in Hollywood without spending a dime, really, losing a dime. So that's what it was, was B-movies, low budget, make a profit off the insurance films like Joel Silver did with Mel Gibson in Forever Young, which is a rip off, the first ripoff of my work. They used Mel Gibson in it and he profited off it, Forever Young, where the allied officer comes back after not aging and finds his wife aged. And that's love story. And they even called, my mine was Helena, and they called her Helen. So the thing is, like, that's what you see is all about saving money is part of the uh, uh, the card, clever card playing in Hollywood now, too. So by using digital, they can save money also. But also you're going to see a program in the future if it's not already in works or existing where digital films will have a program where they'll have the look of analog film. You're going to see a, a rendering program, which is going to make a lot of money if it's not out there already. I guarantee you. And uh, they'll take, then they'll, they'll say, oh, well, then we can backtrack this and uh, redo these films. Now, it's kind of like making black and white films and colorizing. It's not going to have the perfect effect. Right. It's not going to allow that artistic touch where the camera's going to be pulled or use a certain lens or how to focus at a certain point with a pool going on. So it's not going to enable that. It would just be a wash that has the appearance of analog. But so, yes, we're, I think what we're going to see, though, what we talked about earlier, is we're going to see a, a phasing back into what is a new Hollywood or even Hollywood done away with and personal studios throughout the world where you're going to see uh, the original art coming back as a celebration of the art form. A so, more pure studio. Absolutely right. That's what we're hungry for. Those worth their salt actually have a uh, heart anchored in the artistic uh, value of it, the artistic rendering. So we're going to see that happening again. It's like they took our paintbrushes and gave us um, blunt spoons. And what we want to do is go back to the paintbrushes, you know, with all the, all the different ability and options available to us. Of course we will. So I think you're going to see a resurgence of um, back to natural movement, uh, back to uh, artistic values. And so, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Yeah, it's... Um, it's been a blessing to have the digital film here for <laughs> especially um filmmakers like myself where um we're getting things at least for right now with um what's going on politically locally we're able to go out to these places and instead of lugging around a bunch of film reels and um all of right. that stuff we just have it on one one simple device where we can record okay. goings on and then get it spread out to the rest of the community so that they know like these are your representatives the this is how they're um presenting themselves mm -hmm. and um i always try to leave it up to the people watching of uh how they get, gather their opinion on things well i think so, it's very important it's like in the industry what did the what did the warner Bros. attorney say to me in fact the lead attorney Linda burrow was classmates with the attorney that provided me to throw the case johnny rankin was suspended license she said you know well, we made it first she said given the fact you wrote the matrix she actually said that during the deposition given the fact you made the matrix because they were so blatantly feeling they were going to throw our case because they already had thrown it with statutes and everything by providing your own attorney to run the clock with a suspended license so after she's saying that she said well, we made it first we made it first. Well, that's not what copyright law is about, right, Steve? It's not about who makes it first, right? So they made the argument that I was sitting on it while I'm losing everything and having my life destroyed, that they actually did a service by making it first. That's a mission of guilt when it comes down to the fraud case when we actually resurrect this thing with fraud has no such limitations. But this is something important for filmmakers like yourself, for filmmakers out there, especially new ones, Digital format is important because if they're going to use that argument, who made it first, make your piece first digitally, get it down, and then you have something that can be shown and establish you made it first. We can play their game. Yeah, yeah that's very well said. And I've thought about uh, making some, like some of my projects I have right now, I, I do want to make a feature film on 
35 mil. But uh, it'll be very costly to do so. Mm -hmm. And um, the next best thing is to shoot in di on digital with uh, some of the high-end cameras that are available now. Sure, sure. Um, I mean, really, 4K looks fantastic on a regular movie theater screen. I've had a Blu-ray disc play where the projector is supposed to go. Mm -hmm. And that ended up having a, um, a whole, um, the effect of a, of a 35 millimeter film. But yeah, going forward, it's, I don't know if it's like doing double work, but maybe what you're saying is to make it a, um, a ju just make some sort of a proof. Some rendering have. of it, some yeah. rendering where you have the proof. That is essential. That's better than having a copyright. Yeah, make like a rendering title. of it, even stick figures, make a rendering so you have a record of that released where it can't be argued you did it first. Right. Yeah, and, and in those terms, I think that's very easy nowadays to do. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's great for everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, um, and also, you're going to see 35 millimeter film in the future. I believe it's going to become less expensive, less expensive, less expensive. As desire comes for it, you're going to have innovators that are going to go, let's make this available to artists. And some of them may just have the heart for great work and create a inexpensive supply of 35 millimeter medium, medium. So I think you're going to see this happen where, I mean, I'm an optimist. I know it. I've survived all this stuff being an optimist. And I know now we've got them because I've outlasted them, they said. But you're going to see good things happen because there's those of us that are coming to power now. And keep in mind what Disney said to me on the tape I have for the documentary team, you have the power now. They're afraid of your power. You, uh, you, you dared to face them down, but you did the interviews and things like this. And that's why my site just got struck for no reason, you know, 404. But the thing is, we do have the power now. They're right. They're just buying time and the clock is ticking on them. So it's very prophetic that they have my clock, the Wachowski's put my clock, Animatrix clock, my exact birthday there. Um, yeah, I think it's very prophetic that the clock is ticking against them. We have all the time in the world. Now, do you think they're running out of money on their end? And would that essentially be their downfall? Yes, because I think there's uh, a sense of um, uh, contention and uh, dissatisfaction among uh, the different powers to be in the cabal in their own boardrooms. You'll probably see some smashed furniture. These people are not happy when they're told by Mike Lang or Harvey Weinstein or Joel Silver, we're taking care of this. When a sister is bought so blatantly and fails in the latest attempt to put me away, when they fail at what they said, they're doing sales pitches to do it. We can get rid of this guy. We can get rid of this girl. We can take care of this. We're going we're gonna to solve your problem. We'll be the cleaners. And they fail. The cabal doesn't look lightly on that. That means somebody has to pay a price. And the cabal, the rule is somebody pays for failure. And if you fail at your job to eliminate somebody, then you yourself could be eliminated. And so it is not a pretty picture. It's not a field of flowers with gummy bears. It is a situation where they're under the ice all the time. And if they don't do evil and succeed in the evil plans, then evil will befall them and they'll lose everything. So you betcha the Wachowskis, look for what happens to them in the future. That's the reason they had to become simulated as women, basically. They're not really women. They're still guys. They're still dudes wearing dresses. But the thing is, like, yeah, they had to fake like that for the agenda of Warner Brothers, that transgender thing. But the thing is that they're responsible for putting my high school birthday, my name, everything in the first graphic, which is now causing such a stir. They can't put that fire out with the documentary coming forward where the people will be able to understand that completely. So now the Wachowskis are accountable according to Cabal rules. Mike Lang, you don't talk about Fight Club. That's the number one rule. Same thing with the cabal. You don't talk about the cabal. You don't reveal trails. Mike Lang did that with his massive ego by taking that honeypot wife to bed on the birthday of the author. Come on, buddy. We got your emails. Even though you struck them for our devices, we have them on external storage. It's over. Now, had you mentioned before about Harvey Weinstein being a fall guy for yes. the rest of the industry? Yes. Harvey Weinstein, I predicted he would be let off in the end, and that Harvey Weinstein was supposed to blow all kinds of smoke so that Mike Lang was never brought to, brought to the light. Mike Lang is his boss. He worked for Mike Lang. Mike Lang did such a mess up in the handling of me that with a hot wife and everything. 
that he is now on the block. So that's why even in articles addressing Harvey Weinstein, it said his boss from Miramax Films, they don't use Mike Lang's name. Why wouldn't you use Mike Lang's name? It happened when we were in Canada at the immigration board. Uh, one of their members uh, was Michael Summers was doing this whole snow job on us under Trudeau's doing, calling us enemies of the state, saying I just mumbled all the time. I had brought up evidence about Mike Lang with my honeypot wife. That was the issue. That's when they, during that time is when they announced Harvey Weinstein in the media. That's when they brought it forward, but they never mentioned Mike Lang's name. Wow. Mike Lang is what they're afraid of being revealed because Mike Lang was a bad boy in the cabal. He led a trail right back to Disney. I would never have known about Michael Eisner, the connection with Disney, Robertson, all of that, and Joel Silver. I never would have sniffed, sniffed that trail down, followed those steak crumbs, not bread crumbs, steak crumbs, if Mike Lang hadn't done what he'd done with his ego. And then you consider, as I said, I have Mike Lang on tape raging at me with Becca at his presence at his mansion. Have you ever been approached by um, by reporters or anybody in the uh, media industry trying to write a story about Mike Lang? And no, out to you? the media is owned by um, basically the Pentagon, the FBI, CIA. So they own the media. They really do. And the media controls Hollywood. They really do. The banks control all of them. It really is the banksters that control everything. But you cut their funding, you lose their corporation. It dissolves. So you cut their funding, answer your question, the Wachowskis will disappear. The funding disappears, the criminals disappear. So what happens is that's where it really lies, the funding. And that's been made known to me by the contacts within the industry. They told me it's the banks that run everything, specifically the Bank of England and the Federal Reserve. Yeah, the central banks. Yeah. And those definitely aren't in our favor. No, and the royalty is connected to the Bank of England. You're going to see the royalty playing much more of a position now. Before, they were just dormant. Look at us. We wave nicely and we have some nice smiles. But now it's going to be where they're going to start getting a little uncomfortable because they're part of the elite cabal. And so what happens is they're going to be very uncomfortable about things going on. The minions have not done their jobs. So what happens is they'll get more politically involved now. Watch for it. Yeah, I'm anticipating them to roll out a central bank digital currency to stop accepting cash as payment and um, having everybody injected with a chip in their hand. Absolutely. They'd wave across what the card readers are doing now. From the screenplay. And, yep. It's from the screenplay. Yep. And my character, my character puts his palm up on the glass to get the readouts and sees his credit is gone. The architect pulls his credit. So that's how he knows he's cut off from the program he's been portrayed. There was another film by Peter Weir um, with Justin Timberlake in it. I haven't watched it yet, but uh, I think it was called In Time. Mm -hmm. But they had a, uh, a similar thing. Instead of on the hand, it was on the forearm. And it's a clock that's running. And apparently once that clock runs out, then like you die. So you're always trying to get credits to add on to this clock on the arm. That was actually mine. I actually had written that up and pitched that. Oh my God. Wow. Yeah, that well, was there mine. You go. It was off the idea of your credit being on the palm. And I came up with the idea that people could be rich, would want to have immortality. So they would be able to buy life force from others as almost like a bank. And they ran with it. So yeah. Wow. Thanks, Peter Weir. So that all connects and uh, it makes it, a, like a lot more digestible i understand where all these people are coming from now that they're ripping off your ideas i was groomed to be the face of the christian coalition i was groomed to be the top political guy by pat robertson and i was groomed to be with the fbi they gave me a card that said please extend every courtesy to tom oldhouse i had meetings with the top execs in uh, hollywood and they said that you're the you're the real guy the terry Belliner, who was the um lion king beauty and the beast director broadway director who also spokesperson at golden globes or whatever she had said announced to the new york journals that i was the upcoming playwright so they did all this stuff with me as their golden boy and that's why they stuck me in my own film now, is there an ego in me? I don't think so. I just want to see things righted and we have a better world for my son and for other children out there. That's my goal. 
So no, ego doesn't play into it. They say narcissistic, Sophia Stewart's supposed to be the one that claims to be the mother of the matrix, is claiming that, yeah, Tom Aldous is the evil one. So see how far they go? When you're able to, you know, the Zionist manifesto is very concerned, it says in writings, about an individual having influence in the world. That's where your currency is, influence. If they are known for being the writer of the matrix and all these other films, do you think you would have political power? I was saying what happens in the world. You'd be as rich as Bill Gates and Elon Musk put together. So that's what they say. They always call and say, oh, you're worth this much now, 1.2 billion, you're worth this much now. And more since Matrix 4 even came out and fluff. But the thing is that, yeah, the contacts inside, like Daniel Levin is, is a contact for Disney who handled me, a handler. In fact, the documentary team has been coming up with these labels now, of handlers, anonymouses, contacts. There's different hierarchy and strata in the cabal. And so I'm supposed to lay that out and give examples. No, it's going to be great to do. But he was the one that said, you know, we're going to have you run for president. We're going to put billboards up throughout the nation and say, here's the right of the matrix and have you run for president. That is Disney's main guy saying that. And so do they still to want that to happen? Do they still they, want to do that? If well, I know you're not going to agree to it, but are they like betting on, oh, if one day he does like side with us, we have this all set up to go? They claim I'm a star player on the bench. That's for second. That's one of the honeypot replacements. Stephanie Tanner was came to me and had a red pill, glass red pill for me and said I would raise alpacas in Idaho and that she knew my story was friends with the first honeypot wife, that her and her sister were bred or reprogrammed from Berkeley as babies up and that her sister's married to Patrick, top legal of from Columbia University at Warner Bros. So what you have is I'd be having Thanksgiving dinner with the very person who took my work. So from Warner Brothers, top guy. So what you have is, yeah, their plans were to keep me, as she said, star player on the bench. And so I was supposed to be brought in when the new world order switches. Isn't that something? Because they don't want to be bored. So I am supposed to quote, here's the big phrase, behave myself. That's it. And then my son and I can survive and go to the new world order. But I'll tell you, Steve, I don't want to watch billions die that I tried to help. I don't even care if the majority of them mock me. I don't want to see life killed, children harmed, utterly dishonored and destroyed and dying of manufactured diseases. I don't want to see it. That's not the world I signed up for. Yeah, neither do I. Yeah, that's definitely something in the cards for them. They want to see mass famine, mass drought. Yes, yes, that's in the screenplay. Mass sickness. Screenplay. That's in the screenplay. Wow. And so what you have, you're absolutely right. And that's why they're saying that star player on the bench, that they're afraid of your power now, Tom. That's on the tape for the documentary team from Disney Contact. They're afraid of your power. You've won the chess game. The chess game, they call it. They call it the chess game. That's interesting. Looking in their minds as they spill this out. And they're saying that um, you did these interviews, that um, you have this influence now. Uh, you've won the chess game. You have the power, and they're afraid of your power. And I said, well, what did I do to make them come at me? What did I do to have them do this to my sons and my family? He said, here's the thing I think is very chilling. Here's the quote. It's on the tape. You dared to face them down. Steve, what does that mean? You dared to face them down. What, you didn't roll over with a broomstick up your butt? What does that mean? I think a lot of um, these people in the industry have really um, intimidated others like, like yourself into submission that's it. I, think, I think that's what that means that's it and supplying the wives people need to realize supplying the wives is the number one tactic just like total recall they actually do this just like the truman show they do this they brag about it in their art and so a woman we brought your way this guy named peter who is steven spielberg's great friend he calls him the great spielberg had me come to new york for this fake bogus contract he wanted me to sign which on page 11 said he'd get all my work and all rights. I didn't sign it. And so what happens is we sit down in this cafe to discuss something. And this beautiful woman comes up in this um, spring dress. I guess that's how they see me. I guess they, the kind of ultra 50s idea. Sits down next to me, doesn't say a word, right next to me, right next against me. And I continue to eat my lunch. What are you doing in the situation? Continue to eat my lunch. And, and Peter's still talking to me. She gets up and, and when we're done, we leave. She says, he goes, you'll be seeing her again. It's what they did in the Truman Show. So it's like, yeah. That's how they operate. They cast shows. They cast lies. They put you in your own work and supply your own wives. Wow. Yeah, it's... um. 
it's still hard for me to get over, um, but I will. But it's hard for me to get over all of these films that I've looked up to for all these years. Really, it's looking up to your work, but presented in a watered-down fashion. That's right. Badly ripped off, cheap in budgets. The little girl at the train station was supposed to be at a crowded scene with people who were ragged pushing their children forward, screaming for the attention of anybody in the program. Yeah, it's it would have been more impactful, too, than what was That's right. presented. That's right. And so they put it in Legend with Will Smith, who was supposed to be Neo, and did it badly in Legend. They had to use that up, just like Interstellar, using up the daughter and father scene. And they used it up badly with a woman that did a very bad job of going, like, take her daughter in the crowded scene. So they used it up in Legend, they did it badly, and shame on them, damn them. To use they, they were talking with Will Smith first. So what made that fall through that they ended up going with Keanu Reeves? Because the suits demanded Keanu Reeves be used. The oh. suits that Warner Bros. demanded the Wachowskis use him to save his career after Johnny Lightning. Okay. Yeah. He was being groomed. People wonder if he's a good guy. He was who the suits lift up, groom, promote. Even in the Spongebob movie in the trailer, they show his face, real life face, coming out of Spongebob's image. They literally made him look like Jesus Christ mm -hmm. in that film. Or if you can call it a film, the Spongebob movie. They had him, yeah. They had him part of the ripoff and the payoffs. In Matrix, what they did was they had Keanu Reeves give millions to all the people on set who were part of the union. And also give the bike uh, stunt team... Uh, Harley Davidson's, and claimed that it was the greatest act of charity. These are union wage people. That's not a charity act. If you're giving it to the people that are starving in LA, homeless, yes, that's an act of charity, Keanu Reeves. But this was just laundering money and payoffs to set crew and those guys through Keanu Reeves. So it's not, and it's supposed to make him look like he's a great charity guy. No, he's not. They call him the saddest man in Hollywood. No, he's not. He is partying, doing drugs with his biker friends and everything else. I know that firsthand. And he's very afraid of the mortals thing coming forward. He is doing very, very well. And the thing is that he's involved in some very shady dealings, including his girlfriend and the baby she was going to have. And that is connected directly to him. Shame on him. He's one of the worst of the worst, just like the lady that just left Warner Brothers being presented as this wonderful class act person. No, she's a stooge, stoogette that has been very much involved the last three decades in the cover up and laundering of films. So is... Um the girlfriend that was going to have his child, is that the same person as his wife? And I don't know. I don't know. I'm looking farther. It was his wife and daughter. I know it was the woman that conceived his child and was killed with drugs in her and sent from the party. That's what I'm talking about. Whether that was okay. his wife. So it's probably a different person. Then. Yeah. Cause so he, did he have his wife, um, like assassinated in a sense like was he i wouldn't be surprised i would not be surprised at all look what becca northcutt told me who's now becca libby lynn with mike lang what did she tell me when she said it's all about the laws of nature and that you you know you you feed the weak are your food and she even was talking about ordering human steaks from india that's what she was into i was like no way but what is what was she saying she's saying that she would be replaced by another woman in hollywood when the when they would bring me in to groom me if I took the offers, if I would be ruthless and not have compassion, then I would make it. And she was in tears that she'd be cut out of her job. It was a job. So Keanu Reeves with a wife, he would know that someone uh, would be desirable, beautiful, trophy wife in the future would be provided him if he does what he's supposed to do. And yes, as Becca said, the wives are removed that when you are brought into position and replaced, wow. like you're casting a show. The Truman Show. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure um, how much more to expand upon this today. <laughs> I think you've done great. I think you could cap it right there. Just know yeah. that in Hollywood, it's all about being clever. And they try to up one another. That's why Minority Report has those graphics in it that are so telling. Man in the High Castle has those graphics that are just layered, layered graphics that are going to come back on them now and bite them. And also the Wachowskis, everything they stuck in the Matrix and the Animatrix, Mike Lang taking the wife to bed on the birthday. All these things are so 
ridiculously stupid, but it's based on that railroad track of be more clever than the next guy, because it's all about power, they say. And clever is your currency. And the banks own everything. And that's what these others are under. The FBI will be disbanded, dismantled in the future, as I called for, because they are a rogue agency no longer needed. And it will be because they'll cut their funding. Watch for it. And watch all these agents come forward with their stories that they want to publish, not interested. They think they're going to publish their stories and win the affections of many beautiful women by bringing their stories forward. And for the female agents, beautiful men. They think that the world's going to wait for their stories. Uh, David Wilcox, who was a security force for Pat Robertson, Lidge is right. Had, I have a taped conversation with him on the phone. Taped conversation, Mr. Pat Robertson. Where he's saying that he keeps a dossier on Robertson. He'll benefit from anything Robertson does for him. He'll allow the crimes to go on until Robertson falls. Then he'll reveal him. That's Robertson's closest guys. That's the system. That's how it works when it's all about power. Take note, Julia Zarco, Julia Althaus, the sister, and the cousin and the brother that has bought Jack Althaus, the pedophile. That's what happens, even on the home front, when you're now a liability because the author survived and his family survived and is now being brought in, thriving with a documentary. So they become a liability where before they were gonna cash in. And they cost a lot. They're very expensive tastes. Look at my sister. And eventually, if um, they continue to follow this path, they will also be kicked to the curb at some point. Or, elim once, or eliminated. Once, or eliminated, yeah. Yeah, the suicide uh, will call on them. Yeah. I hope that it doesn't come to that point. But it's amazing what happens, Steve. There's so much dirty, so much horror. My dad was murdered by her as her SPOA starved her to death, took 40 days, that I have no feelings for her whatsoever anymore. So if anything happens to her, we're actually going to feel freed from um, the horror. I would never do anything to her. There's no way. But the cabal will eventually. And she chose her table. She chose her bed. And it's wrong. I'm sorry to say that, but she's, she's killing my mom. She killed my dad. She's trying to rip my son away from me. She's helping aid and destroying everything we're doing and has done repeated 302 attempts with this corrupt congressman who's also a lifelong FBI operative. I'm done with her. Well, I am looking forward to the fall of um, these organizations as am I. That are controlling everything. As am I. See, that will show you something. When these family members, different family members are bought like this and rewarded off the charts. Oh, my God. My cousin Todd was modeling Armani, Boss, and everything else the day after he sold out. He was modeling all these different clothes and everything, bragging about it. Um, and these trips he was getting after the cabal bought him off. And after I lost everything. So you're going to see these people fall from grace. That's the key. That the cabal lost its power. Especially when Brian Fitzpatrick... Look up Brian Fitzpatrick of Pennsylvania, lifelong FBI operative, who was sent to Ukraine to stabilize it, sent to Ukraine just recently again. When he falls, that means the cabal has lost their star player. The game yeah. is over. I'll keep an eye out for that. Keep an eye out for that. So, and when Mike Lang falls, so Mike Lang and, and uh, Brian Fitzpatrick, look them up. When they fall, it is game over. <laughs> Well, it's been great talking with you again, and um, I mean, thank you for having uh, or spending your day with me talking about all this again, and um, I'm glad we expanded into new territory and uh, a few different topics that kind of brought together what we were talking about last time. Mm -hmm. I hope um, this helps people digest what's going on a little easier mm -hmm. and um i would like to do this again with you and pro probably um a little sooner than a few months from now because i think let's there's a lot that's going to be going down let's schedule it up let's schedule it up i would love to do that you would ask me my favorite movies too and i would just tell you yes, yeah. yes. Uh, so Eddie, um, um it's interesting because the wachowskis claim the same thing they claim they just claim whatever i claim so it was Blade Runner, um, Galactica, and I actually do value Avatar, not what James Cameron's doing with it, but the original writers that were denied credit. 
the work they had. My stuff was blended in with it. The Jackson Back to the Neck, everything else is actually in there. Library members with the tree, it's all in there. But they blended our stuff together just like they wanted to do Cypher Man and Immortals. But my favorite movies are that. And then if you go historically way back, I really do like Rollerball. I thought it was way ahead of its time. Rollerball really was. And for uh, something that was a wake-up call, Soil and Green with Charles and Heston, I think was something that really, really was a shake-up move of warning, warning, warning. So I, I would lift those films as uh, things that um, really stand out to me. So. Excellent. Yeah, for, um, for my list that I put together, <laughs> um, I put Mad Max to The Road Warrior. Um, I, I really like the post-apocalyptic nature of the film and um, defending your own compound against outsiders trying to uh, overtake it and take a, and kill your whole family and friends and all that. Right. So that message was really nice, uh, regardless that Mel Gibson's in it. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, I think it's a it's a strong film overall. Um, also, They Live by John Carpenter, and um, that's that stars Roddy Roddy Piper and um, a few other actors that are in John Carpenter's films. Uh, I believe it shares the same actors from The Thing mm -hmm. with, um, <sighs> forgetting his name, I think it's Kurt Russell, Kurt Russell in The Thing. But, uh, yeah, They Live is, is really high up there now, along with um, Mad Max, The Road Warrior. And, I mean, I'd add the thing, but that, I mean, there's a lot of negativity in that film. I try to find a good balance of, mm -hmm. of something inspirational, but also eye-opening. And um, So I, I guess I only have a list of two right now. Right. Since I had to start from scratch, <laughs> <laughs> I understand. But uh, as I rewatch things, then that's how I am compiling this new list. Sure, because um, they had to throw the old one away. Yeah, no, I understand. There's nothing they I can do about that. I gotta I understand. Rethink a lot of what I got into film for, but also it gets me down to the basics again, and on uh, um, helping me understand why I got in to doing what I'm doing now. And that's really to, I mean, inspire others. And it's kind of a feedback effect where my inspiration um, grows with getting uh, responses from other people and um, influencing and uh, inspiring them as well. Mm -hmm. So I think it's kind of a give and take industry. In, in the ideal industry that we want to have and not right. this conflated one where everybody's out to cut each other's throats for money. So. That's right. That's absolutely right. And it's interesting in my situation, some people will come forward and go, or shills will come on and say, his eyes look evil. Um, he's arrogant. It's like, if I look like I'm putting on a strong face, if they said I faced, dared to face them down, I'm going to face them down into finality. I'm going to do it. So the face I show is what the other side's seeing and they're on the run. So I'll continue to, no matter what it's deciphered to be or whatever people want to comment on it. Um, I am going to finish this job and I'll finish it strong. Yeah. I see determination mm -hmm. and I agree with you. Continue um, going out there talking with Chantel and everybody. Um, I think it's healthy for you too, to, to just run through this stuff on a semi-regular basis. I sure. mean, I know you're doing this off camera too, but I mean, it's good to have it out there for people. I know um, you did you did a recent um, interview, I think, on Open Your Open Your Reality. I think so. Yeah, yeah. So that that interview had people going and finding our first interview. Good. So it went. And um, it carried through. So it's, um, the, I guess the main point is your story's getting out there. More people are becoming aware of it. 
and um, they are sitting down and watching the entirety of these things. And Good. I'm I'm hoping that people are just absorbing this information like a sponge because I do too. I appreciate that. It's really um, I it is really important for this to get um, publicity the way it is. Well, that's what the other side said. They said that we've won the chess game because of it. That's important to really let it sink in. We've won the chess game? Wow. And if they just struck my sight, they're very concerned about people receiving. That means they don't know how to stop the flood. So I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I mean, I, I'm going to keep this stuff up as long as I can. I know YouTube's not the best, but at the same time, it's the most accessible for people. Sure. So as long as I'm still on there, um, everything else is going to remain up to. Perfect. All right, so, Steve. It's been a pleasure. I'm so glad you had me on. Yeah. Yeah. And th thanks again for uh, taking the time today to, to talk again. And um, I'm looking forward to speaking with you again. And until then, I guess um, take care of your health. Uh, <laughs> Which is funny because <laughs> the, the spraying, yeah, I got, you can hear the upper respiratory, stuff like that. So the whole block yeah. is coughing and sick but yeah after the spraying yeah i had a yeah, really yeah. bad sinus thing going on for Sorry. a while there but um yeah. i mean it's cleared up since very good and um i like the fish you have back behind you there oh yeah i figured celebrate life why not so yeah yeah, yeah definitely and it's funny i would say you know people can reach me at redpillrising.org but it struck it struck it so um yeah, so where, where can people yeah. reach you now they... on twitter on twitter you can twitter, find okay yeah, and uh, also on um, oh, what was the other one? Uh, Facebook. They can find me on Facebook. Let me see, on Twitter. It's just Tom Althaus is the handle for Twitter. So you can find me there. And on Instagram, if you want to find me on Instagram, it's Thomas A. Neo. I played back on what they put in the uh, first graphic. So Thomas A. Neo 4477. So that, that's another one. And uh, so, yeah, you can find me there also. So I'm starting to branch more and more out to get out there because that's exactly what the cabal said was the biggest problem for them. And what's interesting, Steve, is you're going to see the cabal switching around different players. It's, it's a collective hive. And so you're going to see different players within the cabal and the different agencies connected to the cabal all starting to make offers to come on board with resumes in hand. So you're not going to see guilty suddenly guillotined. You're going to see guilty switching ships, you know. Yeah, like and different players being pushed forward in the meantime as distraction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and they'll be saying, yeah, we stuck your stuff in the films, Tom, and uh, we were actually for you. Nice play. Again, that 48 ways of power, play both thrones, and then pick the winning side. And if the winning side inverts, then pick that winning side and claim you're always with them. We know how the story goes. So, yeah, anyway, pleasure to be with you. Yeah, likewise. And uh, yeah, until the next one. You got it. Next time. Take care.